Everyone, thanks for sticking around into the uh, second afternoon. Uh, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, my name is Spike Curtis. I'm a core developer on Project Calico. Um, and before I worked on Calico, uh, I was a forward deployed engineer at Palantir Technologies. Um, and so I helped them deploy uh, their intelligence application that you know helps uh, the intelligence agencies and police uh, find terrorists and criminals uh, into really, really secure uh, government networks. So um, what I want to talk about today, though, is, uh, is networking for Kubernetes. And I'll, I'll start by reminding you something uh, that you all already know, which is that networking is important. So networking used to be the, the thing that allowed you to reach your customers, allowed your customers to, to reach your application. But now um, our ambitions for what applications uh, should be have grown much faster than Moore's law. And so applications don't fit on single boxes. Even if they could fit on single boxes, we wouldn't want to because we want to be able to um, have high availability. Um, so the, the network is now something that's integrally involved in the actual running of your application. It's not just the thing that, that brings people to your door. So networking is really important. Um, we all know this. Uh, and what I want to talk about today is what are the characteristics of the network that um, are important? You know, given that networking is important, how do you know what, what you should be doing for networking? What, what makes different networks uh, different? So I'm going to tell you about three things. Um, but before I go into those three things, I want to start with one kind of foundational characteristic of networks, which is that they run on IP. So modern applications, cloud-native applications, they don't speak Apple Talk, they don't speak IPX or NetBIOS or any of these other protocols that we used to have. Um, and while Ethernet is still the, the dominant interconnect that we use, physical interconnect in data centers, um, our applications don't talk over Ethernet. They don't, they don't send Ethernet frames directly to one another. They send IP packets. So IP networking is what we're talking about here. Uh, for containers for modern applications. All right, so act one uh, is an origin story. Um, my, my colleague Christopher, uh, a few years ago, he wasn't working on Project Calico, he was working with a bioinformatics company. And if you don't know what bioinformatics is, it's uh, information processing, that is to say computing, on data from biological systems. So mostly we're talking about genetics. So you've got gene sequencers, they're outputting petabytes of data that are, are genomes, and the end result that you want to do is you want to study genes. So um, he's setting up this OpenStack cluster like you do. Each researcher has an isolated environment, um, and that isolated environment has a virtual Ethernet segment um, associated with it. And then um, it's time for an OpenStack upgrade. So cue ominous music here. Uh, this is Essex to Folsom. And uh, during the upgrade, networking breaks. So Christopher's you know, uh, diving through logs, trying to debug what's going on, attaching probes. Um, and he eventually gets to what, uh, what we'd like to call a proximal cause. He finds that the, the packets that are uh, destined for other VMs in the same environment are getting switched onto the wrong virtual Ethernet segment. So, that gives you broken VMs, but the question is, why is, is OpenStack doing this? Why, uh, is, uh, why are these frames ending up on, on the wrong networks? So he's, he's doing more debugging and more debugging. You know, he's hours in, and then he runs into this. This is the actual diagram from OpenStack's networking manual, right? And this is too damn complicated. Like, what, what were we thinking when we put this thing together? Like, uh, Christopher spent 36 hours debugging this cluster, right? Christopher, if you don't know him, um, designed uh, and built one of Australia's largest uh, networks when he worked for Telstra. He can debug multi-continent, multi-provider IP networks in 10 to 15 minutes, and 36 hours in, he can't figure out a 24-node OpenStack cluster. So it gets him thinking, why is this so difficult, right? IP networking is not this hard. Um, the internet itself is less complicated than a 24-node OpenStack cluster in terms of networking. So he asks himself, 
you know, can we make this simpler? Well, actually, can we make data center networks look more like the internet? So here's a, a schematic diagram of some corner of the internet. Uh, you've got routers, they speak control protocols to one another, in this case, BGP, the border gateway protocol. And um, back in the day, you had a single server running a single service, it had a single IP address, and it was connected to a router, right? That's how the internet works. Uh, obviously today, we don't have um, single physical servers running single services. What instead we wanna do is containerize those services, give them each an IP address, and connect them to the network. So this architecture is Project Calico. Right, we, uh, on the compute host, we use routing, so not like virtual uh, ethernet segments anymore, no, sig or no uh, encapsulation or things like that. You basically turn each computer into uh, a little router, and that's Project Calico. So if we zoom in on just one of these hosts, uh, this is what it looks like. You've got your container, uh, which has a network namespace, so it has its own isolated IP stack, and then it's connected via a virtual interface into the root namespace, and in that root namespace, uh, the virtual router is just the Linux kernel. We insert routes into the Linux kernel uh, to tell the Linux kernel where to send the packets, so uh, containers that are hosted on this host get routes that point to the virtual interfaces. Um, containers that are not on this host get routes that point to the next IP hop, which is either a router or another compute host if they're connected over um, Ethernet, not via a router. Right, so that's it, just routing. Um, super simple, very easy to understand. Um, and uh, we use the, the, the same control protocol, BGP, to announce these routes to other containers. So what that means is that in your, in your physical network, if you attach a probe um, and watch the traffic going by, you'll see the real container IP addresses. You'll see you know, 10.0.0.1, um, and you'll see the real ports that your application is actually using. So IP routing is, is, very, uh, is very simple, it's very flexible, it's very powerful, it um, powers the, uh, the global uh, internet, but it's also very operationally simple, right? There's just one routing table on each host. You can type IP route and see uh, everything that, that's going on. It's very simple. But that simplicity also has a lot of operational benefits, right? Because we don't use overlays, because we don't uh, encapsulate the traffic, when it's time to send packets outside of the cluster, it's just IP routing, right? A couple of config tweaks on your border router, and then you can send data in and out of your cluster. Um, it also means that the, uh, the IT operations uh, teams in your organizations, they've been building and running IP networks for years, right? This expertise that they have on IP networks applies directly to the data center network, and um, all of the tools that they've been using, like ping and traceroute, just work. So that's the first thing, is simplicity. And I wanna stress here, it's operational simplicity. Because you build your, your data center, your cluster once, but you actually operate it for years and years and years. So you wanna make sure that it's the operations that you invest the, the, the time and effort into um, doing the cost savings there. Okay, so we've reached Act Two, uh, Act Two Laws. Um, does anybody recognize this figure? Say, say again? Yeah, so this figure is, uh, was drawn by Gordon Moore uh, in his 1965 paper, Cramming More Components Onto Integrated Circuits. And that paper is the origin of what's now known as Moore's Law. So what's going on here is number of components is along the horizontal axis, and he's plotting the cost per component at that level of integration, how many transistors you have on the chip. So the sort of sweet spot uh, of, of where you're actually gonna manufacture your chip is at the bottom of that curve. And you'll see that as years, uh, as time goes on, we move out to the right. So we're going to higher levels of integration, right? That's the usual formulation of Moore's Law. Computing power doubles every two years. Actually, uh, the length of time has changed over the decades. Sometimes it was as fast as one year. Sometimes it was as slow as two and a half years. But the point is that we're exponentially growing in computing power. But the, the other side to this, the bit that um, doesn't get mentioned as often, although I think is more important, 
is that that sweet spot of uh, low cost manufacturing is not just moving to the right, it's also moving down. So computing power is exponentially decreasing in cost as the years go on. Now this was 1965 that he wrote this paper uh, a little more recently. You can pull stats like this and ask, well, how much does it cost to do compute? Um, Amazon EC2 is a good yardstick. Um, and you'll see that from uh, 2012 to uh, 2015, we've had about a 60% drop in computing prices. So uh, how many of you in your organizations have uh, trimmed your IT budget by 60% since 2012? Actually, trimmed is a, a bit of a, a euphemism. How many have slashed their IT budget by 60%? All right, so uh, how many of you have made any significant cuts in your IT budget since 2012? Okay, a couple. How many have uh, the same or greater? Right, so, so if you haven't thought about this carefully, this is really, really shocking, right? Computing prices are falling. You know, the roof is falling out on, on how much it costs, but yet we're still spending uh, the same or more. Now, uh, what does the E in EC2 stand for? Elastic. So what we're saying here is that demand for computing is incredibly elastic as well, right? When the price falls, the quantity demanded goes up. So uh, there are, are two main reasons for this. Um, one is competitors, right? Uh, you, you guys all have competitors. If you just sit around and slash your IT budget but don't do any more, then your competitors are gonna steal your market share. Um, the other thing is even if you don't have any competitors, you're in some crazy startup in a new market, um, when computing prices fall, you have two choices about what you do with those dividends. You can apply it against the bottom line, that is cut costs and therefore make a, a nicer profit, or you can invest those dividends in the top line uh, by building new capabilities to uh, earn more revenue. So guess which one of those two things uh, VCs would rather see you do? Uh, growth on the top line or growth on the bottom line? So the point that I'm trying to make here uh, is that scale matters, right? Things are getting bigger and bigger. Even if you're in a, a business that, that's just totally frozen, it's not growing at all, you need to scale by a factor of two in two years. If you're in a market that's growing or you're doing some new venture, then you're gonna be scaling farther and faster. So you need to be in a situation where you can, uh, where your network can, can scale and keep up with you. So in Calico, we built uh, Calico based on you know, the biggest network that we know of, the internet. So we, we've chosen the architecture of Calico specifically because we know that architecture scales. BGP is the control protocol that's used in the backbone of the internet. We know it scales to hundreds of thousands of networks. Um, IP, uh, sorry, the, the Linux kernels, uh, IP routing, we've tested it with millions of routes. It doesn't break a sweat. It eats routes for breakfast. And we also test uh, Calico. Uh, regularly. So this is just a video um, of some data that we got off a uh, routine scale test. So we're going to 50,000 containers here across 500 hosts. So uh, each of these vertical orange lines is one host, and we declare the containers kind of up and successful, not just when the container starts, but when they can use the network to ping another container. So there's quite a lot of variance. That's called welcome to the cloud. Um, and uh, we're gonna be able to get to 50,000 containers in just over three minutes. I'll skip ahead, just since we're short on time. And those last stragglers are coming in. All right. So think big in your networks. The, the sort of flip side to, uh, to this, this idea of, of having to grow is that if your uh, compute is not growing, that means your business is probably dying. So um, how do you know whether a technology is scalable, right? Um, look for sound architectural principles. Uh, 
uh, look for proven technologies, and actually ask for the evidence. All right, so we've reached Act 3, uh, Act 3 uh, attacks. So um, November 24th, uh, 2014. That's a little over a year ago. Um, Sony Pictures Entertainment employees uh, came into the office in the morning. They started up their computers, and they saw this. So uh, quoting fortune.com, um, before Sony's IT staff could pull the plug, the hacker's malware had leaped from machine to machine throughout the lot and across continents, wiping out over half of Sony's global network. It erased everything stored on 3,262 of the company's 6,797 personal computers and 837 of its 1,555 servers. So um, the, the who and the why of this attack, it, it wasn't in this warning message, but we now believe uh, that it was North Korea and uh, the Sony Pictures filmed the interview which, um, whose plot involved the assassination of Kim Jong-un. But I think the more interesting thing to talk about is not the who or the why, it's the how. How were these attackers able to do so much damage to Sony's uh, IT fleet? Well, again, quoting fortune.com, emphasis mine, once the invaders made it past the network gates, they could go anywhere they wanted to because Sony hadn't locked any of the doors. Sony Pictures uh, built their network defenses um, at the borders of their network. Uh, they used what I like to call the armadillo model. Crunchy on the outside, smooth on the inside. And what happened was that once the attackers made an initial penetration into Sony's network, they used their own network against them and basically used that initial penetration site as a base of operations to launch additional attacks into Sony. And if you think about uh, a, a tectonic cluster of N containers, there are N squared possible connections. Only a tiny, tiny fraction of those connections are actually used to run your application, right? Because front end load balancers don't talk directly to the back end database, prod doesn't talk to dev, um, and every connection that uh, is not running your application but is still open is hurting your security. It's, it's gonna be uh, a place where attackers can make use of that. So, so clearly, you need to have firewalls, and uh, one technique would be to uh, firewall off your tectonic cluster from the rest of your infrastructure. Right? This gear is pretty easy to buy. It's also pretty easy to hire people who have the expertise to set this stuff up. Um, and that may be fine for your first application, but obviously you're going to want a production and a dev environment. Um, and because uh, Kubernetes and Tectonic are so awesome, you're not going to stick with one application. You're going to want another, uh, and then you're going to want the third application, and now your clusters are, are getting out of hand because when you use uh, traditional firewalls, you're actually uh, firewalling off pieces of physical infrastructure. Um, and what that means is that you're stranding resources. So some of these clusters are going to be underutilized. Some of them are going to be oversubscribed, and you can't move the resources between them. So if you want to take advantage of, uh, of the Kubernetes architecture, you want big clusters. Big clusters running multiple applications allow you to take advantage of that and actually run your, your clusters at high utilization. So if you want to still um, enable this, uh, this security, you have to have a firewall that's actually intrinsic to the cluster itself. It can't just be at the edges. It can't just be the armadillo model. So in Project Calico, we call this a, a per-container distributed firewall, meaning that the, the firewall operates pervasively across the entire cluster. And we actually put a firewall in front of every single container that's launched. Now, you can do this as well because, uh, as uh, you know, I mentioned uh, earlier, we like to choose proven, reliable technologies. So we use IP tables. Every one of your computers uh, in, in your fleet already can set up these kind of firewalls. But the challenge is not um, in finding the right data plane technology. It's the management, right? How are you going to manage a firewall on 50,000, 100,000, a million containers? You need something that integrates directly with the cluster manager. And so that's what we built with Kubernetes and Calico. Um, we also support it for Docker Swarm, Apache Mesos, and uh, OpenStack. So I'd like to show you just a quick demo on what this looks like. 
for Calico and Kubernetes with Tectonic. So um, we've got a, a Kubernetes cluster set up, and I have a, uh, is this running? Okay, good. Uh, I've got two different namespaces. Now, namespaces in normal Kubernetes are just what, what they sound like. They are scopes for names of pods and containers. But with Calico, what we're going to do is use the namespace as a network boundary as well. So Calico is going to enforce um, a network policy so that pods in one namespace can't talk to another. So I've got two services set up, each with a pod selected by a, a, a label app equals client one, app equals client two. And then I've got a network visualizer. So these pods are all trying to contact each other and they're reporting out what connectivity they have. So uh, client one can reach client two and client two can reach client one. Now I'm gonna jump over to the web app namespace. And in that namespace, I've already started two more pods. Uh, one called front end one, and one called database. Um, sort of hinting at you know, a, a typical two-tier application architecture. So we're gonna create some services uh, that select those pods. So the service will be titled front end, runs on port 9000, and it selects the pod that's labeled app equals front end. And I'm gonna create a second service for the database. Same deal, port 9000, app equals database. Now that those services are up, I have DNS entries, and so all the pods are gonna be trying to uh, communicate with one another. So we're gonna jump back to our visualization and do a refresh. And you'll see that I've got now two different sets, totally isolated. So one and two can talk to one another, but they can't talk to the front end or back end uh, pods because they're in a different namespace and Calico is using that firewall to enforce that isolation. Now, this is actually a little too isolated, right? I've got a web app, but no one can connect to my web app because I've firewalled off the connections. So what I'm gonna do is modify the front end um, service and tell Calico to let people connect to the front end service. So we do that with a label. So I'm gonna add a label to this front end service, uh, project Calico dash policy equals open whereas before for the namespace it was closed, meaning don't allow connections. And that's it. Now my service is able to be reached by anyone in the cluster. So we'll do a refresh, and you can see that client one and client two can initiate connections to the front end service. They can't initiate any connections to the database because that is still closed. And you'll also notice the front end can't initiate connections out to client two because Client one and client two are still in their own isolated namespace. So we're actually doing this connection oriented. Um, you know, we, can, we can send and receive requests, like I can you know, make a, a, a web request and get a response back, but I can't initiate a connection from, uh, from the front end to, to something that's not in its namespace. So I like to think about um, the amount of isolation as a spectrum in terms of the granularity of this isolation. At the really coarse end, you've got the armadillo model, just kind of throw everything all in one pot and then build a big wall around it. Um, what we've just shown is uh, a little bit more fine-grained. So now we're isolating out different apps and different instances of those apps, so prod versus dev, um, app A versus app B. And that's where we are with, with Tectonic and Kubernetes today. Uh, but Calico is actually much more powerful than that, right? We have IP tables behind us, so, and we have APIs, so you can actually uh, do a lot more than just kind of create isolated environments with IP tables. You can isolate down to individual ports, uh, uh, TCP, UDP ports. So um, you might think about a, a kind of medium-grained policy where not, I'm not just considering uh, different apps, but I'm actually breaking up the apps themselves. So a sort of classic three-tier um, uh, architecture that enterprise people will recognize. You know, you've got your web, your app, and data tier, and that means that if someone exploits uh, the web tier, then um, 
those pods, even if they're run by attackers, can't connect back to the database without going through the app tier. But the end point that we want to get to is, is being able to isolate down to basically having no open connections that aren't really being used to run your application, right? The problem with these like web uh, data and app tiers is that, for example, web servers, they don't need to talk to each other. They only need to be able to talk to the app tier. So you don't want to have all these stray connections that, that uh, attackers can use even within tiers. So we want to be able to get to a stage where we isolate down and only open up the connections that, that your uh, developer, the person who designed the app, knows that the app should be using. And that's what we can do in Project Calico. Um, we've got APIs uh, that allow you to do this. So you can go through uh, either a Calico command line or a REST API. Um, but I want to make this a lot easier. And so that's the work that we're going to be doing in the next weeks and months, is actually taking uh, Tectonic and Kubernetes from where it is now to being able to express some kind of description of how your app works, what connects to what, and then lock down the network so only those network connections are allowed. So, you know, I started this talk by, by reminding you uh, about networks, you know, ha having changed from, um, from being the thing that, that allowed you to reach your customers to now being integrally involved in running the application. Unfortunately, there's an analogous change in the way that attacks work. It used to be that the network uh, allowed attackers to get to your front doorstep, but you just built a really big impressive door and that was good enough. But that's not, that's not good enough uh, today because um, attackers are now using the network itself to continue to attack once they make initial penetrations, which unfortunately are, are just too easy. Like you can't keep everything um, patched, although CoreOS is making that a lot easier, at least for your production applications. That's not gonna stop phishing though. It's not gonna necessarily make sure that all the devices and um, uh, personal computers that connect to your network are secure. So like in the Sony case, they thought it was spear phishing. So you, you really need to harden your network against these attacks so you can limit the amount of damage. So these are our three, operational simplicity, scalability, and security. We think those are the most important characteristics of networks, and that's uh, what drove our design decisions about Project Calico. So uh, you can visit us on projectcalico.org. Um, second link there is instructions for how to put Project Calico on an existing Kubernetes cluster. There are also getting started guides if you want to bootstrap a cluster from scratch. That includes Project Calico. Um, and we also hang out on Slack. Uh, we've got a, a Calico users Slack channel. Um, anyone can, can sign up and, and get on that Slack and then uh, talk to us about what you're working on or if you have, have questions or problems. Uh, Calico is open source. It's Apache 2 licensed. Download it, try it out, let us know what you think. Um, I am at Spy Curtis on Twitter, and uh, we are at Project Calico. So um, I think I, I still have uh, enough time for one or two questions, or however many Redbeard, one question. Choose, but choose wisely. Right here. Yeah, so, so the question was, uh, what components does Calico have and where do they run? Um, so Calico uh, operates uh, based on an etcd cluster. So that's the sort of master, but it's, it's, it doesn't have any of the Calico logic in it. It's just the data store. Um, and then there is an agent that runs on every host that's responsible for configuring uh, the IP tables firewall um, and also adding routes to the, the containers. And then we have a BGP agent, which is actually just the open source bird agent uh, that runs BGP. And then there's a plugin that uh, talks to Kubernetes. So that also runs on every node in the Kubernetes case. In other cases, you have plugins that plug into the, into the master, depending on what your orchestration system is. We, we kind of don't care where the plugin runs. Fantastic. Cool, thanks. Thank you very, very much to Spike. Always a pleasure.